Hey guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. I've been getting a lot of boa related questions from you guys and so I thought I'd take a few minutes and answer some of the more relevant ones. I always try to answer your questions as best I can in the comments but often I don't have time to go into detail so today I'm going to expand on some of these answers. The first question is what causes kinks in boas and as you may know boas are sometimes born with this abrupt uh, bend in their spine at some point in their body. This can actually be caused by a number of different factors. One possible cause is incubating the female at too high of a temperature can result in kinks and other types of malformations in the developing uh, embryos. Uh, another cause is slugs. So if you have a female with a lot of slugs, there is a possibility that some of the embryos are going to be pushed up against the slugs as they're developing. And because they're kind of wrapped around the slugs inside of the mother, they might lead to the boa being in this awkward position leading to a kink in the spine. And then another possible uh, cause is just random acts. So whenever uh, boas or any kind of animal is developing embryonically, it's a very complicated process and there's loads of things that can potentially go wrong. It's actually quite amazing. It works so well so uh, much of the time. So you can just have this random, you know, indeterminate event that happens. It's completely unpredictable, nothing that anybody did wrong, and you just have a boa that's born with a kink or some other malformation. So if you breed boas, eventually you're gonna see some of these things, just something you'll have to deal with. Then the related question is what do you do with a kinked animal? And so this is somewhat controversial. Uh, as far as I'm consider, uh, concerned, if there's a very minor kink, such as in the tail or very minor kink in the spine that has no impact on the boa's functionality, if it's able to eat and you know behave fine, typically I'll sell this as a pet only at a reduced price. But if there's a kink um, that is pretty major, like a very sharp angle and it's maybe in the neck and the animal isn't going to be able to eat food or survive unfortunately these animals will need to be euthanized the next question is what are your thoughts on keeping boas in outside enclosures and so i've seen that some successful breeders that live in tropical or subtropical areas like florida and they actually keep the animals outside and this can be very beneficial for them to have access to the outdoors, but there's also a lot of things you need to keep in mind. So if you are thinking about keeping a boa outside, you need to be absolutely sure that you can provide the required environmental conditions. You know, the temperature, the humidity, etc. It's going to be a lot harder to keep the optimal condition outside than it is inside. So you need, you know, to focus on that. The other possible concern that I have is that your animal might escape the enclosure. And so, depending on where you live, um, if someone hears that there's a giant pet snake, you know, a giant boa constrictor that broke out of its enclosure, this could be a really a bad PR. This could be a PR nightmare for the whole herp community. So be absolutely sure your enclosures are secure and they can't get out. And then also it's a concern that there might be other animals that could you know cause damage to your snakes if they're kept outside for example rats or raccoons or possums things like that skunks they might get into the enclosure and try to eat your snake so or your snake might try to eat them for that matter which probably isn't a good idea either so for that reason i would really think twice about keeping your animals outside and unless you're in a situation with a really ideal climate away from no nosy neighbors and there's zero chance that your animals are going to escape or get uh, you know uh, attacked by a uh, prey animal in the wild i would really not uh, recommend doing this keeping them outside the next two questions concern one of the worst things about keeping boas or other reptiles and that is reptile mites and so the first question is should i treat my cocoa husk substrate with anti-mite spray and so i'll say that it's generally not necessary to treat substrates with anti-mite spray unless you have a mite infestation or you have a quarantine set up where you're bringing in a new animal that might have mites uh, that you want you're concerned about so some people have um, this idea that you can go out and you can buy substrate um, even at something like you know buying a mulch at home depot it might bring reptile mites back to your animal and so although this isn't theoretically impossible, it's highly, highly unlikely that 
buying you know some kind of a cocoa husk at a local garden center that doesn't sell reptiles would be carrying reptile mites. So it's generally not necessary to spray with the uh, anti-mite spray. You know, that being said, if you go into a reptile store that has reptiles and you know, you're buying the substrate from that store, th there is some chance that you th could have mites in the substrate. Although it's still pretty unlikely because they're, they're sealed bags and the mites are not likely to leave the reptile host and go into the substrate. You're much more uh, at risk in that situation if you touch one of the reptiles or if the mites get on your clothing, something like that. So I would say if you ever see any reptiles in, or any mites in a reptile store, you want to run away really fast. Don't go into that kind of business because you don't want to get the mites and bring them back. But in general, you don't need to spray um, substrate with anti-mite spray if you have a non-infected collection and there's no risk of uh, any mites if you're not bringing in any new animals. The second mite-related question is, can my boa get mites if I put it down on the ground outside and should I wash the boa with Dawn dish detergent afterwards just to be on the safe side? So this is also highly unlikely. If you take your boa outside and put it down on the grass, it's pretty much impossible that there's gonna be reptile mites unless you had another snake there that had the reptile mites just you know minutes before. The reptile mites are native to Africa and they don't live in the wild in North America. It's you know not entirely clear how they got into the captive populations. It might be due to uh, ball pythons but it's unclear and they're really the chances are pretty good that the reptile mites in captivity now are completely different from the wild ancestors since they've been in captivity for decades we've been bombarding them with all kinds of uh, toxins so they've, they've been evolving strength to our reptile mite sprays and they're really getting adapted to you know life in captivity and unfortunately it doesn't look like they're going to be going anywhere anytime soon so you have to be really careful about these but the odds of getting it from putting a snake down on the ground outside are very very slim so I would say in general you don't need to wash your snake with Dawn dish detergent after putting them outside because it's pretty much impossible to get reptile mites in that way next question have you heard anything about people claiming that anery or anerythristic boas have bad attitudes and what are your thoughts on this and so this is actually probably my only only straight anery boa and it's actually a locality specific anery. This is a Paraguana Peninsula boa from Venezuela. Really cool locale of dwarf boa. And what makes this guy even more special is he's anerythristic. You can see he's got this beautiful silvery gray appearance with a uh, complete or almost complete uh, absence of any kind of red or yellow pigments. It gives him this beautiful look. So as far as attitude problems or aggression in anerythristic boas, this is not something I've encountered. And um, although different localities of boa will often have different personalities, you know, some of the Central American boas can be a little hissy. Um, you know, some of the true red tails can be a little insecure and they really squeezy. Whereas, you know, I find that some of just the normal Colombian boas are kind of the more me most mellow types of boa. As far as morphs, there's not generally any um, behavior patterns that go with a specific morph. It really has more to do with the genetic background of the particular animal. So, you know, when we're talking about a morph gene, we're talking about one gene, but boas have tens of thousands of genes. So it's the other genes that typically are gonna determine the uh, aggression or the behavior, you know, as well as the history of handling of the animal, and et cetera, things like that. So. Uh, in general, I would say that there's not really a connection between a, an anerythristic boa and aggression. Um, this particular animal, you can see he's quite calm and mellow. And I haven't heard anybody making any kinds of claim that anerythristic boas are more aggressive. Our next question has to do with red tail boas. So I thought I'd change up the snake and show you this beautiful uh, sub-adult female Suriname. A red tail, a, 16, a 2016 baby. This one is going on five years old. And so the question is, if I have a lot of experience keeping snakes, but I've never kept a boa, is there any reason why a true red tail can't be my first boa? 
And so you may have heard that I've often recommended that people who haven't kept a boa before avoid keeping a true red tail as their first boa. The husbandry of true red tails is a little bit trickier than most other boas with much less tolerance for you know, conditions that aren't ideal. And also the behavior and personality tends to be a little more uptight, a little less mellow, you know, and with pet quality uh, attributes. And so that being said, this isn't an ultimatum, you know, this is just advice that for probably 90 to 95% of first time boa keepers, they'd be a lot better off going with something like a normal Colombian boa or even a morph boa or, you know, a dwarf boa like a Tarahumara boa than a true red tail. And so many people enter the world of boas because they're blown away by the beauty of true red tails and I can understand why. And maybe they miss the more subtle beauty of some of the other localities. So they just get in their head, they want a true red tail and maybe they get a baby um, and they have no previous experience with boas you know maybe they feed the baby uh, once every week because that's what they've read in all the boa books and the animal ends up regurgitating uh, going into this downward spiral and it ends up dying a few months later in general true red tails are really not the best boa for beginners but you know, if you've done your homework and you've made all of the plans and got all the right equipment and can provide the optimal husbandry, there's no reason why a true red tail can't be your first boa. It's up to you to determine what the optimal boa is for you to start out with. And again, for 90 or 95% of first time boa owners, I would strongly recommend to think twice about a true red tail as your first boa. The next question is around radiant heat panels. And the question is, in your video on installing a radiant heat panel in your BOA's enclosure, I noticed you put the thermostat probe on the cool side. Why didn't you put it on the hot side? So the reason I put it on the cool side is I wanna keep it away from the BOA um, out of the way of where it could accidentally be you know, pulled down by the BOA or you know, interfered with by the BOA. If I put it on the hot side, I don't want it right up against the heat emitting panel because that's going to get to be somewhere around 120 to 130 degrees right at the panel. And so if I mounted it at the top of the enclosure near that, that would be way too high and I'd have to turn my thermostat conditions up to like 130 just so that my hot spot can be around 88 to 90 degrees. If I put it on the floor right where the hot spot is, that wouldn't be secure and the boa could end up messing with it. So I found that the best solution was to mount it through a little hole on the cool side of the enclosure, you know, from the top of the enclosure down through the hole and it's out of the way of the boa. And so basically I set the thermostat to be around 78 degrees or so at the cool side and then automatically the hot side will fall in the 88 to 90 degree range. And that works because my background ambient temperature in the room is about 75 degrees year round. So you'll have to experiment with, uh, if you're gonna set one of these up where the optimal uh, placement of the thermostat probe is and what the optimal temperature is, you just want it out of the way so the BOA can't interfere with it. The next question was a little bit unusual. And the question is, I'm five foot one. Am I too short to keep a pet boa? And so the good thing about keeping boas, there's not a height requirement. This isn't like Disneyland where you have to be four foot eight to ride the ride. So that being said, you, if you are a smaller size and maybe you're concerned about the size of the boa, you may want to look into a dwarf or semi-dwarf form. This is a crawl key boa. This is a a female who's almost full size, she's about four feet. They get maybe another foot long. And there's quite a few uh, dwarf boas like the Tar Humara, Kral Key Boa, Corn Island Boa, etc. There are also semi-dwarf boas that get into like the five to seven foot range. So if you think that a big snake is gonna be too much snake, if you're not uh, very tall, you might wanna think about one of these. That being said, the size of boas has been so widely exaggerated you know, of all the boas I've ever kept, the largest have been about nine feet long. Uh, you know, currently I think my biggest boa is around seven and a half, eight feet long. Um, this includes, you know, the larger types of boas like true red tails. Although they can theoretically get to be 12 or 13 feet, humans also theoretically can grow to be seven and a half to eight feet, but we don't see that very often. So again, there's really no height requirements if you want to keep a boa regardless of your height, you know, go for it. I don't think that should be what holds you back. 
So the next question is, I've been following your channel since you started, and I've noticed that you've recently gone down to a twice a week uh, video posting schedule, as opposed to the three times a week schedule you were doing originally. Why are you posting fewer videos? Okay, so there's a number of reasons for this. Lately, I've been super busy with breeding. You know, I, I've had to put a lot of time into my breeding pairs and monitoring them, as well as just my general reptile keeping activity. So that's taken a huge amount of time. Um, I work full time on a full time job not related to reptiles. Also, have a family. I have a house that I need to keep up, and I have other non reptile pets. So I'm super busy guy. You know, I tried originally to make three videos a week, and I could, you know, I kept it up for a while, but it got to the point where you know it was just too much. The other thing is I've been trying to put more time into each video. When I first started, my videos were basically me talking the snake, me showing you the snake, kind of like this format. But I've been, I have a new video editor and I've been trying using B-roll, using music, making the videos a little more dynamic. And so I think it's a better quality product, but it takes a lot more time to edit. So some of these videos can probably take 10 to 15 hours just to film and edit. So it's a lot of work and you know, we'll see how it goes. You know, I think the point of my channel is first and foremost is valuable information. I want to get you guys the most valuable, useful boa related information as quickly as possible. And so if the, you know, the production quality maybe isn't quite, you know, I'm not an IMAX, I'm not, you know, DreamWorks. I'm just one guy and a camera and a bunch of snakes, but I want to get you guys the info. So that being said, I'm aiming for two to three videos a week. And we'll just see how uh, things evolve with my time. Certainly, I'm not running out of ideas. I've got loads of cool ideas to explore. And I'm always open to your suggestions for cool topics for future videos. So keep those comments and suggestions coming and I'll try to see what I can do about making these videos. Okay, so the next question is really a bunch of related questions. And I often get this, these requests where people send me photos of either their boa they've just acquired and they want to know what locality or what morph it is, or they send me a whole litter and they want to know what morph all the babies are. Okay, so in these particular situations, I can look at the animal and I can say, well, that's, it's consistent with what I would expect such and such boa to look like. But with locality, there's really no way to be 100% sure in most cases from just a picture. The only way that you can be sure of the locality is to have the documentation and the chain going back to the original founder animal that was collected in the wild. For example, as I've said many times before, there are no physical characteristics that can definitively differentiate a Guiana from a Suriname red tail. You just need the locality information. And then in addition, there's often a lot of boas on the market that are of mixed ancestry and they might kind of look like one locality, but not quite. So it's often that's also very hard to judge from a picture. So keep sending the pictures, I'll do my best, but I, I, I'm not a boa certification service. I can't certify that your boa is this or that. So please don't expect that from me. And as far as morph boas, it's probably even more important to document the origin and the you know the breeding source of these animals just so that you can be comfortable having some idea what it is for example the different albinos like the call and the sharp are virtually impossible to differentiate visually and you have to do a test cross to do that your animal also might be het for a bunch of different uh, genes so you might you most uh, boa genes, you're not going to be able to see markers in the hats and you're going to either need reputable documentation from the breeder or you're going to need um, to do the test cross. So people will often send me pictures of their morph boas. They may either have acquired it uh, and they don't know what morph it is and I'll take a look and I'll you know, do my best to tell what it could be, but it's still no guarantee. And then sometimes people will buy a morph boa from a breeder who told them it was a hypo jungle and they just want confirmation. Well, usually if the breeder is reputable and has a good reputation, you know, the breeder you probably should trust. Um, so just a caveat about, you know, identifying morph boas. And then one last thing that I get a lot is someone will have just had a litter of boas and they want uh, help identifying them 
you know, they might have, you know, some sun glows and some albinos and some uh, hypo jungles and ghosts, things like that. You know, in some cases, like a super hypo, it can be virtually impossible to tell just by appearance. Um, you know, so again, uh, in, in these types of situations, I'll take a look, I'll do my best. But ultimately, if you're breeding a morph project, you should really educate yourself looking at pictures online of all the different possible offspring so you can make an educated guess about whether it's a super hypo or a, you know, sun glow versus albino, etc. So we have time for one more question, and this is another morph boa related question. So the viewer asks, what is the best morph to make a lot of money? Pretty upfront question. So as I said before, the best way to make a small fortune breeding boas is to start with a large fortune. So that being said, um, I'm not against making money with boas. You know, I think that that can be a consideration, but the first priority has to always be the husbandry of the animals. You have to put that before the money, okay? And you always have to be concerned that you're doing the best for your boas, husbandry-wise, and you, you have their, their best interest at heart. And so if you've taken that into consideration, and you're also trying to make a little money to put back into your breeding operation and to cover the expenses, because of course bo bre boa breeding is very expensive, there's really nothing wrong with that. It's not immoral to want to try to make money back as long as you're uh, considering the welfare of your animals. And so that being said, I think as far as morphs, probably the best uh, word of advice, pick a morph that you love. Something that's visually appealing to you and something that you wouldn't mind holding on to for a long time in case the babies don't sell. Because of course you have impeccable taste in boas and if you find a morph appealing, chances are pretty good a lot of other people are gonna find it appealing as well and the market will stay strong. So there's definitely differences in qualities of morphs. Some of them are just more appealing than others. And it's partially personal opinion, but it's also, you know, they just have that wow factor. You know, for example, leucocystic boas. You know, they have the wow factor. Uh, scoria boa is another one. I mean, these boas, people see them and they're just kind of like blown away. You know, other morphs are just not all that uh, striking and probably they're gonna come down in value pretty quickly. Um, so that being said, I think there's really three different price points you can get into with morph boas. You can get the, you know, the high price point, which is typically $10,000 range. So these are animals or morphs that are just being established. You might even be the first person to establish the morph. And so this is potentially the most financially rewarding. Also the highest risk if something goes wrong. Then you have kind of the mid-tier projects. So these are typically around the one to $2,000 range, you know, for a single gene animal, more for the combos. And so these are things, um, you know, IMG boa is an example. Um, you know, some of the other morphs that have been around for five years or so, but are still quite popular and, you know, quite sought after. Um, and so these animals will likely come down in price still. But if you pick things that are really, you find appealing, you know, chances are that other people will as well, and they might hold their price, their value for longer. And then lastly, you have the bottom tier, and this is no means uh, referring to the quality of these animals. These are just morphs that have been around for, you know, a couple decades, things like call albinos and jungles and anaries and motleys. So these are animals that are typically just a small uh, premium over just a normal wild type common boa, uh, typically around the $200 to $400 range for a single gene animal. Um, and so these animals have actually, the value has already depreciated pretty much as much as it's going to. It's not going to go down anymore. And, um, you know, so therefore it's much less of a risk as far as the project, but it's also potentially less of a reward um, over, you know, one of the more expensive projects. And personally, I have a lot of, you know, I don't have a huge number of morphs, but half of what I have is basically what I describe as the third tier, the, the morphs that have been around a long time. And then I have a few of kind of the mid tier, you know. Um, I don't go for the big buck stuff. It's just too much risk for me, and I'm just not into that kind of that aspect of breeding since I'm really more of a locality boa breeder. 
So that being said, there's a lot of other considerations to making money in boas, and I'll probably do a video devoted specifically to morphs and making money in the near future. I've done a couple of videos in the past about pricing of boas and you know financial aspects of boas. So check those out if you want to uh, learn more. Anyway, I hope this was, uh, video was helpful and I answered some of your BOA questions. I always keep the questions coming for a future installment of Brian BOAS. Thanks for watching and enjoy your BOAS.